Welcome to this week's episode of Accredited Investor Markets Radio. Each week, we speak with you about investing in alternative assets. Unbiased and beholden to no one, Accredited Investor Markets Radio does not accept advertising from any investment firm or financial advisor. Accredited Investor Markets Radio is the spoken word sister of AccreditedInvestorMarkets.com, the internet's most comprehensive and unbiased educational resource about crowdfunding, angel investing, venture capital, private equity, private shares, and other investment classes beyond publicly traded stocks and bonds. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Accredited Investor Markets Radio. I'm Christopher Cahill. Later on, I'll be speaking with Ted Neald of Gresham Partners, not for the first time, for the second time. And Mr. Neald will explain what it is investment advisors can do for you. But first, let's talk about Pluto. Why not start with uh, humanity's ability to wonder and humanity's ability to summon brilliance and technology and money, quite frankly, to explore and learn about nature, even nature at the furthest extent of our solar system. So Pluto's out there. Is it a planet? No, not a planet. Well, it's part of our solar system, so we go to learn about it. Well, not two days after this um, particular segment is being recorded, the New Horizons project of NASA, and you can go to www.nasa.gov to learn more, um, which is NASA's and humanity's first mission to the Pluto system and the Kuiper belt, will come the closest it will go to Pluto two days from now. It's pretty exciting. Turns out Pluto's not blue, it's kind of reddish. They're learning all sorts of things about Pluto, you know. Uh, fairly recently, the Hubble telescope identified four moons of Pluto, which have been named Nix, as in Nix that, Hydra, Styx, and Kerberos. Now Styx is S-T-Y-X, of course named after the river of the dead in Greek mythology, or maybe it was named after the still more ancient rock band from Chicago. I don't know. I, we shouldn't assume these things, should we? Well, the, the NASA website has many podcasts delivered by impossibly young and brilliant scientists, which tell you things. We've learned that Pluto's atmosphere is, in some respects, similar to our own. Both of them are about 70% nitrogen. Um, the difference is that the rest is two thirds oxygen for us, thank goodness, and mainly methane for those on Pluto. Not that there aren't anybody on Pluto. Um, the other interesting thing for me about Pluto is that it has an elliptical orbit, more elliptical than our own. That is, it gets farther away from the sun and then closer to the sun as it orbits. And when it's farthest from the sun, the gases in the atmosphere of Pluto, remember it's way out there. The gases in the atmosphere of Pluto freeze and fall to the surface. Imagine that, which just goes to prove that men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and Chicken Little is from Pluto. But more about the Kuiper belt. Kuiper is spelled K-U-I-P-E-R. Clearly, the Kuiper Belt was named for Dwayne Kuiper, a Major League Baseball player whose career lasted from 1974 through 1985. He has since become the storied and beloved play-by-play -play announcer for the San Francisco Giants. But when he was playing, Kuiper batted left and threw right, which is a little unusual. Um, so did, by the way, Hall of Famer Billy Williams of the Chicago Cubs. But Kuiper hit 425 fewer home runs than Billy Williams. In fact, Kuiper hit but one home run in his entire 11 year career. He holds the major league record for the most at-bats hitting just one home run. That's quite a record. Babe Ruth hit one home run every 12 times he came to the plate. Kuiper hit one home run in 3,379 at bats. So the one and only Kuiper belt out by Pluto 
is named for the man who hit one and only home run, or at least I hope so. Um, that would be better than the truth, most likely, so let's go with that story. Sticking with the truth, the June 29th Wall Street Journal writes about fintech, something we maybe spend too much time on here, but it's really interesting, otherwise known as peer-to-peer -peer lending that's done uh, online. And the fintech entity involved here is Bond Street, uh, which lends up to $500,000 on a one to three year cycle. And in the example given in the article, online firms seek to eat banks lunch. Uh, it's a Japanese restaurant, a Japanese steakhouse in New York, which benefited from one of these loans because it could not get what it needed from the bank. So who else is lending in this space? Well, a few familiar names to those who pay attention to these things. Prosper Marketplace, Social Finance Inc., and Funding Circle Limited. Also popping up are companies which match lenders like this with those who need loans. Credit Karma and Lending Tree um, are two of these. Lending Club is another fintech lender. The article makes a couple of important qualifications, though, and I quote, for all their potential, fintech companies still have to prove they can grow. Only 800,000 consumers have taken out a loan from one of these upstart lenders, according to Autonomous Research LLP. Further, uh, Jamie Dimon, of course, he's from one of the banks, JP Morgan, opined that online lenders have yet to demonstrate how their loans would perform in a recession. Well, perhaps that will be the foundation of questions next time I have one of these cats on my show. But to go with the fintech or alternative lending theme, just one more item. Our own business transition and exit planning website, and you can find that at business transition and exit planning.com or through the financialpoise.com portal has an article entitled, When the Bank Says No, which I think nicely covers the field on different kinds of alternative lending um, for small businesses. It talks about bank constraints. It talks about the nimbleness of alternative lenders. Rick Rosenblum, a managing director of Fuel Break Capital Partner, puts it, as follows, alternative lenders charge a premium for providing quick response, creative financing solutions, and additional liquidity for non-standard situations, but it's worth it when you need to quickly access capital, end quote. Well, such situations might include a simple liquidity gap. That happens to small firms as they await a receivable, or maybe there's a seasonal component to their work, or maybe you need some funding in order to pursue an opportunity, and it's hard to get the bank to react quickly. Of course, alternative lenders tend to charge higher interest rates, but if it's that or nothing, well, you'll go for that. Uh, the banks have left the gap and alternative lenders have entered the gap. The article takes up hard money lending, and that's higher interest rates and uh, pretty aggressive um, secured aspects to the transaction. Hard money lenders, hard money lenders make sure that they're covered. And that features a quote from Dan Ambrosino of White Glove Capital. White Glove Capital is a company where if you have a boat, well, they'll be happy to tow your boat somewhere and lend you money on that boat. And with respect to online lenders, the article quotes from Sam Hodges of Funding Circle, who has been a guest on this show. The article also takes up factoring, which is lending on accounts receivable, and merchant cash advances, among other things. I think it's a fine article, um, in part because the author is Christopher Cahill, somebody known well to me. Now, before we go any further, the Business Transition and Exit Planning website um, is directed at business owners and their advisors, business owned privately, that is, which have been good at making things or providing services, but maybe not necessarily so good 
at confronting the sale of the business or the transition of that business uh, at the close of the founder's career. It has other recent articles that would be of interest to such business owners and their advisors or those who want to deal with such business owners. For example, there's an article entitled Valuing Your Company's Online Assets by Avery Cohen of Metrist Partners. Metrist Partners is a marketing concern. And I guess if it tells you about valuing your company, it would also be of interest to valuing any company, including one you might be investing in with respect to its online assets. Another article called Choosing a Business Appraiser by Gary Lotzer of Vantera Partners, LLC, which is a merchant banking firm and corporate advisory. Okay, pedestrian thing, choosing a business advisor. Do you know how to do it? <laughs> do you know what questions to ask? An article like that can help you. Having said all that, Let's get to the interview. We're very lucky to have for a second time as our guest, Ted Neald, the President and Chief Investment Officer at Gresham Partners, LLC. As Chief Investment Officer, Ted leads Gresham's investment team as it establishes investment themes, identifies opportunities that fit within the firm's risk-conscious investment approach, and sources investment managers worldwide. As President, Ted sets and leads the firm's strategic direction and chairs its operating committee. Before joining with Gresham, Ted served as Chief Investment Officer at Nuveen Asset Management, among other senior positions he held there. As we mentioned before in the first episode with Mr. Neild, uh, Ted has authored two white papers which are on our site, AIMKTS.com, as well as on his site, Gresham Partners, all one word, dot com. And these two papers, which are very good, also serve as a foundation for his remarks last time and this time. Last time, he focused his remarks on one of them, which is entitled Challenging the Conventional Wisdom of Portfolio Construction. Today, we're going to focus on his second white paper. That is, you can read that paper usefully with listening to this, which is entitled Challenging the Conventional Wisdom of Manager selection. Thank you for being with us again, Ted. My pleasure. Okay, so let's, uh, as we finished last time, I think if I can sum up, we were talking about how it's a good idea to invest passively. It's not a bad idea, but you can do better than that. We see in investors making mistakes with the managers they choose, because not all managers are successful, and it's evidently pretty easy to point to relatively unsuccessful managers. But you suggest that there's some upside to choosing managers. That's correct. And it's probably as best to go back and maybe set the foundation with some of the academic work that has been done in the industry. And then I think what has become commonly accepted practice within the industry based on those studies. And so the first is a series of studies, probably the most famous of which is the Brinson B. Bauer studies that go back to the late 80s and early 90s. And essentially, those studies stated that somewhere over 90% of the variability of portfolio outcomes are driven by asset allocation decisions, not manager selection decisions. The second series of studies that has been ongoing, quite frankly, have led to a, a series of conclusions that most active managers fail to beat their benchmarks after accounting for fees and expenses. And the, the numbers on those studies vary, but generally, you'll see that a majority, and some people will even say almost all of active managers fail to beat their benchmarks after fees and expenses. And so the logical conclusion from those two sets of studies is that as an investor, if I can get my asset allocation decisions right and then simply reduce the cost by, of an implementation by investing in passive funds or index funds, I am going to put together a pretty good investment plan that should be able to work over a long period of time. Our view is that the studies are, are well-researched, but they're flawed. So, Ted, um, you're familiar, I take it, with the Warren Buffett bet with a particular hedge fund person um, that over a seven-year period, it is now the sixth year of that seven-year period, the S&P 500 would outperform that person's hedge fund uh, once you accounted for fees, and evidently he has done quite well with that. 
Well, oh, yeah. Warren Buffett's not a not a stupid guy. He doesn't make bets that are losing bets, or so I think he's got a pretty good chance of of, of winning that bet. And I don't know the hedge fund that he's that he's making the wager with, but I tell you that probably ninety five plus percent of the funds will underperform the S and P five hundred. It's been a particularly good period for the S and P five hundred so far. Yes. And then, quite frankly, most most hedge funds have underperformed. On the other hand, I can introduce you to a handful of funds that have done much better than the S and P five hundred. And so. It's not the majority, but there are funds out there that do well. And so back to this idea of where investors should go with their money, we have seen over the same period of time that Warren Buffett made this bet, investors are actually following this advice, believing that most actively managed strategies will underperform their benchmark. And you see that in the flows. You see passive ETFs and index funds getting a majority of the inflows. And at the same time, active managed equity strategies are actually experiencing about the same amount of outflows. So investors are voting with their dollars. They're shifting from active to passive. Well, what's not to like? Well, that's a good question. And I think really there are a couple things here. First, let's go back to those studies. Uh, yes. We think those are well-researched studies. The, the methodology is sound. The problem is we think they measured something that's very narrow, and secondly, they've taken then those results and they've extrapolated them to something well beyond what they're measured. So on the first point, what they measured were, were institutional investors. So a lot of pension fund investors with very simple portfolios, constructs such as uh, cash, uh, bonds, and stock as the three major asset classes. And if I have a very simple portfolio with no nuances to be able to invest in uh, private equity or hedge funds or things that can have the potential to, change the nature of the uh, balance between asset allocation and, and uh, active management or manager selection, then by definition what I'm going to get is a study that tells me that asset allocation is the primary driver of my decision. Secondly, these studies really looked at very efficient markets. They're primarily looking at U.S. markets or in some cases developed global markets and fixed income markets. And those are some of the more efficient markets around the world. The challenge then is they take the results, what they perceive to be the results of those studies, and then they extrapolate them into much less efficient space, into emerging market equity or into private equity or places like that. And in reality, those markets present much greater opportunities for active strategies to add value and the dispersion in those markets is much higher, and you really want someone thinking about the risk in those markets and managing the risk in those markets and finding good opportunities. And so for those reasons, we think that investors can actually do much better than, than markets if they have access to the right investment solutions. So in a less efficient market, um, you have a greater chance of success. I guess one could turn that around and say in a highly efficient market, information has already been figured in to price because you have so many people participating. Whereas in a less efficient market, there's a lot, there, I should say there's a greater degree of unknowns that a wise yes. or, or, or adequately a trained person who's also very wise and perceptive can discern value that isn't really reflected in price. Yes, that's exactly right. Less efficient markets provide greater opportunities for active managers. The, it, the pricing is much less efficient. And so, People have become very dogmatic about this idea of, of active versus passive, and there are a lot of devotees of the passive school of management, and I think that's fantastic. But the answer, it turns out, is not so black and white. It's not yes or no, active versus passive. It's actually, it depends. And so it depends on the circumstances, depends on the manager, depends on the opportunity set as to what you should uh, try to achieve in your implementation. So Ted, why is it that so many managers underperform their benchmark? Why wouldn't they do just as well as the market? One of the pieces that I recently read on this subject is written by uh, Charlie Ellis. It's, he called it Murder on the Orient Express, and I think they published it in the Financial Analyst Journal. And like the old novel that I'm sure you've read where everybody's responsible for the murder, it's somewhat the same in this particular case. There are a lot of contributing factors, whether that's the manager themselves or consultants or investment committees. A lot of people have contributed to the problem that we see today of chronic underperformance. But a couple, uh, maybe an easy way to think about this and a couple factors to consider is let's start with an actively managed portfolio. And, and let's say that actively managed portfolio has 10% uh, in cash, which is not unreasonable. And if the market's up 10%, that 10% in cash is going to provide a 0% return. And so they're already one percentage point or 100 basis points behind the market. Yep. When you put a 1% management fee on top of that, now you're 200 basis points behind the market, and you haven't even picked a stock yet. Oh. 
And so there are just some structural reasons that it's hard to, to outperform the market. And there are a lot of reasons that it, it happens, that, uh, that it's hard to make up those 200 basis points and more. But that's a basic construct here. Okay, so how find the good managers? Well, so there are a, a couple things you can do. And I, ironically, what, what I would say is the most important thing is not the characteristics of the manager, although I'll tell you about a few of those later on. But going back to what we said earlier is what pond is the manager fishing in? So if, if the manager is investing in large cap U.S. stocks, the odds that that manager is going to outperform his benchmark after fees and expenses and cash covering cash drag and all those things is very low. You know, on average, we see in a good year maybe about a third of the managers outperform the benchmarks. Uh, and then when you put that together over a couple year period of time, that number gets very small very quickly. And so it's a really, really hard thing to do in a very efficient marketplace like the U.S. large cap stock. On the other hand, if I take you over to, let's say, emerging market equities, and you look at the median manager, most years the median manager in emerging market equities is going to outperform. Ooh. And so the first question an investor needs to ask is not who is the manager, but where are they investing? Okay. Uh, well, now you've, uh, you've piqued everybody's interest. So you want a manager. It might be a good idea to find a manager who is able in emerging markets. Now what questions do you ask? Well, not just emerging markets, but I think any market in general. Here, here's the frustrating thing for most investors because the characteristics I'm going to describe, in some ways they sound like common sense, meaning the investor would say, well, of course those are the managers that I want to invest in. But in reality, what happens is these are not solutions that most people have access to when they really stop and think about where they're investing and the mutual funds they're investing in or the open architecture, separate account platforms at these big broker dealers. These are not the solutions that they're investing in. And so let me give you a couple of characteristics and then we can talk about the consequences of that. The first one is you want somebody who's pretty experienced. Now that doesn't mean that that person has to have run his strategy per se for a long time. Track record's always helpful. But sometimes you've got some very experienced people that are actually coming out to launch a new fund, and sometimes that can be a substitute. But in the end, investing is an accumulated knowledge business, meaning you have to have lived through some of these difficult periods. You have to have experienced it. You have to have made, made mistakes, and we call it cutting your teeth on other people's money, and that's great. But you have to have been through it. And so we look for managers that are experienced and have gone through difficult periods of time. The second characteristic, and this is just as important, is they have to be disciplined with their capital base. We have an old saying that the enemy of every asset management firm is assets under management, and it seems antithetical to the business itself. But what you find is that the larger you grow, the more assets you manage, is that those little teeny interesting ideas, you'll still find them, but they are so small relative to the assets that you manage that it just doesn't make a difference anymore. And so it's like turning a battleship. You just can't generate the performance on a large asset base that you could on a small asset base. So here's the challenge. If we find a, a, an experienced manager who has done very well over time, and they are really disciplined about the capital that they raise, most of those managers are closed. They don't want new phone, they don't want phone calls, they don't want new investors, they don't need new capital. And what that means is they're not managing strategies in a mutual fund. Format. They're not managing strategies in ETF format. They're not on the open architecture platforms of the, the banks and the broker dealers. And so most investors just don't have access to those managers that have those two simple characteristics. And as I said, it seems really obvious that that's what you'd want. But unfortunately, that's not what people get. Okay, now let's say you believe that you have a line on somebody who meets these criteria. Uh, then we get to the question of fees. And fees are a sensitive topic. I mean, after all, uh, these days when um, the federal administration is talking about raising the fiduciary standard uh, with regard to retirement investment, what they say in order to urge people to uh, accept this is often in reference to fees and fine print. But fees matter, as you pointed out. An entire basis point in some examples could be sacrificed to fees. So. 
you find a manager you like, what should you do about fees? So um, we're all in favor of minimizing fees. And so to the extent that you think the probability of, of beating a benchmark after fees is low, you should try to minimize fees. And so let's go back to the U.S. large cap market. It is even some of the managers that we find, it's going to be a lower probability event that you beat the market. Lower than emerging markets, lower than other less efficient markets. And so I think it's a very reasonable thing for investors in some of those markets, if they don't have access to these types of managers, to focus on minimizing fees and investing in low-cost passive strategies or ETFs. I completely agree with that idea. On the other hand, there are markets and strategies that, that do justify higher fees. So, for example, if you look at the dispersion of top quartile managers versus bottom quartile managers across every asset class, and this is an interesting chart to look at sometime. On the, on the low end of the dispersion chart, what you'll see is fixed income managers and U.S. Large cap, large cap managers. There's just not a lot of ability for those managers to differentiate themselves. And like I said before, those are not managers you should be paying extraordinarily high fees for. At the other end of the continuum, you'll see a series of managers, let's say hedge fund managers or private equity managers or private real assets or real estate managers. Those are all strategies or areas of the capital market where there's enormous dispersion between the really good managers and the not so good managers or worse, the, the really bad managers. And so if you can get to the top of the top, and I don't know how many that is, but in our opinion, it's not a lot of managers, you should be willing to pay for what is true high value added strategies. And quite frankly, even after paying their management fees, and sometimes a lot of these managers have incentive fees, they take a percentage of the gains, even after paying what appear to be extraordinarily high fees, these managers are worth it. They generate materially different performance on behalf of, of their clients. The challenge is that most of the managers that charge those fees are not worth it. And so getting access to those managers and quite frankly, being able to evaluate those managers and determine who is good and who is not good is a very difficult thing to do. Well, Ted, let's say that somebody has $2 million uh, to invest. Would it make sense initially to leave 1.5 in your uh, index fund passively managed and try out somebody for a period of time with the rest? You could. Uh, this gets back to the question of, of trying to evaluate uh, managers. And I'm a big fan of, of Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote uh, this passage. It was actually a discussion of Enron. And in it, he picked up on this idea of the difference between a mystery and a puzzle. And very simply, a, a puzzle is something that if you have all the right information, you have the pieces per se, you can put together a complete picture and you can understand in concrete terms what you have. A mystery is different in the sense that no matter how much information you have, you'll never be able to come to the right answer because there isn't a right answer or it's so clouded that you'll never be able to see it. Most people think about finding a good manager as a puzzle, meaning that they think if they can dig up enough information, they can get reports from Morningstar, they can do their own analysis, they can reference check, they can get in and on a stock-by-stock -stock basis evaluate a manager, they can figure it out. The reality is this is human nature, and there are a lot of unknowns, there are a lot of variables. And so what really ends up happening is that manager evaluation is not a puzzle. It's really more of a mystery, and it takes a lot of judgment of doing this over and over and over again and seeing a lot of different managers to come to an informed opinion, and it really is only an opinion, as to whether the manager we're talking about is one of those select few that is worth paying more fees for. And it's a difficult thing to do, but it's, it's worth the effort if you can get it right. Well, I'll tell you from my own perspective, I would prefer a manager who suppresses some of the mystery by avoiding buzzwords. And I can say that, <laughs> and I can say that in your uh, white papers, you do avoid buzzwords. Um, and I'd like to just uh, suggest a distinction to the audience. Anybody who talks about a complex su uh, subject has to use terms, which could be called jargon, which denote important concepts in a brief way. And, and jargon can be explained. And jargon's okay. It's buzzwords to which I take offense because buzzwords are there to impress. They're, they're brandished as a flourish to enhance the authority of the speaker without bringing any extra meaning. And I must say uh, that your white papers are clear and uh, free of buzzwords, and uh, I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. That's, a, that's actually a very high compliment. I appreciate it. Well, Ted, are there any closing words? 
Well, you know, it's got to be frustrating for investors who have been let down by active managers. And uh, so I understand that the desire for passive solutions, and quite frankly, we use them in a number of our different uh, circumstances with our clients. But I just think the, uh, the dogma about there is no such thing as a good manager or the odds that a, a manager underperforms is, is close to zero, I, I think that's an overstatement. And if you can get to the right people, it really can make a difference. And our, our Gresham's history has been one of being able to add value through these active manager solutions. I think if, it, it's hard to come up with a precise number, but if we go back through time, more than half of the value that our clients or value add that our clients have experienced has come from manager selection rather than, than asset allocation. And so it really can be a powerful differentiator, a powerful driver in the pursuit of their long-term financial objectives. Well, that's a whole lot to be able to say. Thank you, Ted, for this, our second very pleasant and informative uh, interview on this show. My pleasure. You've been listening to Accredited Investor Markets Radio. I am Christopher Cahill, the host. Accredited Investor Markets Radio is produced by Stephanie Strait. Let's do this again sometime. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe through iTunes or Stitcher, or you can download our app from Libsyn. You can also listen right on our website, www.aimkts.com. Each week, Accredited Investor Markets Radio brings you news and education about investing with a focus on alternative assets. To see a short written summary of this episode, go to www.aimkts.com. Accredited Investor Markets Radio is a production of Financial Poise Radio Productions, LLC.